Every year, Scotland celebrates St Andrew's Day. But this year's celebration had a special importance because it followed a referendum on independence in which the Scottish people nearly said yes. It was a result which unsettled the United Kingdom as a whole as almost half the Scottish population expressed the desire to break away from the rest of the UK. This was a result which shook the so-called union like never before. It's not the only warning in British politics at the moment. The UK Independence Party, UKIP for short, has won two parliamentary seats in quick succession in a blow to Prime Minister David Cameron's ruling Conservative Party. Over the past year, UKIP has been upsetting the status quo in Britain as the general public rebel against the old political parties. The UKIP victories and the Scottish vote show a shift in how voters in Britain feel and suggest a wave of general public discontent with mainstream politics. And now the new leader of the Scottish National Party, the SNP, has already called for another referendum on the same subject. So why did so many Scottish people express the desire to break away from the rest of the United Kingdom? What implications does this have for Westminster? And how united is the United Kingdom? These are the simple questions we sought to answer. And we began by asking the Scottish people why almost half of them did vote to go independent, separate from the Union. Here's what they said. One reason that they want to break away from the rest of the UK is that they feel that the general political and social uh, ethos up here is very different than what they're getting from the Westminster government and they see no other way of actually changing that situation. For me, I think it's that um, Scotland wants to break away from the UK because they, it's not going well for them, they feel, as a United Kingdom and they believe that things would be better for them if they were independent. I don't think necessarily all Scots want to break away from the UK. Um, we've got strong ties as an island and, a, and as a nation, and I think most Scots want that to continue. I think they the, want another referendum because they feel that they were, you know, up against the odds. You had the BBC and all the media, you know, trying to get a no vote, so they feel that maybe next time it will be a yes vote. I can't really speak for other Scots, but I voted yes because that was the only way I could see of the left making any kind of progress um, as opposed to being stuck in the UK and not being able to do very much. Personally, I don't want to break away from the UK, but Scotland's always had a really strong national identity and I don't think that a lot of Scots feel that it's being served by Westminster. I think Scots want to break away from the UK because they're, they're tired of the British government and the decisions that they've been making with regards to war and the things like that. I think that's a pretty big thing, the, sort of, the whole social sort of way that the, the British government is, is heading, you know, with all the, the big business and all that. So we know that almost half of Scottish people voted yes to independence. And the Scottish National Party's new leader is already calling for another referendum. What's causing this separatist agenda to have such momentum? We asked our experts. I think the 45% of the Scottish population who voted for independence in the referendum in September were part of a great social movement that was centred not simply on the questions of nationalism and independence, but also the issues of the defence of the National Health Service, of social justice, of getting rid of Trident nuclear missiles, of breaking away from imperial wars alongside the United States, and of saying that people wanted fundamental change. That's why so many people voted. 85% voted in the election, a very high turnout for Britain. Uh, and this referendum became a focus for a feeling that exists much wider in the world, but particularly in Scotland, that people were not prepared to go along with the policies of austerity and imperialism and they wanted to break away from it. Uh, that's why I think it became such a large movement and that's why it will continue afterwards. I think the referendum campaign, in terms of the people voting for yes, the arguments were dominated not by nationalism, they were dominated by a desire for greater democracy, the fact that Scotland finds itself being ruled from Westminster by a government people did not elect. Conservatives have got 
fewer MPs than uh, giant pandas living in Scotland. There's only one Conservative MP who's elected to Westminster from Scotland. So they feel that they have a government in London ruling over them they haven't elected. They also feel they're trapped in a United Kingdom state which is addicted to free market policies, extreme free market policies, which has seen a growing wealth divide and an erosion of welfare services, and a state which is addicted to war and support of America, most recently obviously in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. So the people voting for yes, by and large, were voting to leave the United Kingdom to escape that. And as it turned out, the yes vote was very heavily concentrated among some of the poorer sections of the Scottish population. Uh, the areas that voted yes, Glasgow, Western Bartonshire, Dundee, very working class areas, very poor areas. And people clearly rejecting that. Why were mainstream British politicians and party leaders, especially in Westminster, as well as the BBC, so complacent about the Scottish referendum before the vote? The Scottish public said this. They didn't think that people would actually vote for a referendum, uh, for a, a separation. Um, I think we're, down in the south we are very complacent. Because it feels like a long way away. I now live in the south of England actually, have done since January, and uh, people can't really imagine the, the, the Scottish mood, they just imagine it. It's, it's like other parts of England. I think they were unaware of the depth of feeling that people had, and I think it was quite clear that it took them by surprise about two weeks before. <laughs> I don't think they were interested, I don't think they were bothered about it, they didn't care about us, so I don't think they were that bothered. <laughs> God, I don't know how to answer that one. Because the opinion polls were showing the yes vote down below th about 35%, so, th so they were almost certain that it was going to be a no vote. It wasn't until the last six months or so that the opinion polls started to show that the Yes campaign were gaining ground. So then they started to panic and they were panicking the last few weeks. They were absolutely certain that uh, Scotland would not vote for independence at all. I think at the start of the referendum, polling for independence was very, very low. Um, but I don't think anybody really expected just all just how much grassroots stuff there was going to be. And yeah, they ended up panicking in the end because of that. So I think they were quite complacent because um, they didn't think it would go get so close. I think they really um, undervalued the Scottish people and the power of the Scottish people. So I think now they'll sort of um, stand up and um, give Scottish people what they want and more of that. So hopefully. Um, I think there's just, yeah, there's, there's a general feeling that they there was, there was complacency with the politicians down south because I think there's just a general feeling that, that Scotland doesn't tend to matter too much. Uh, and then I think at the last minute they, they realised that they're, they, it does matter. Are there clear reasons for the apparently relaxed initial attitude towards Scottish independence in the British media and the British government? We asked our experts. There was a complete imbalance of coverage of the referendum arguments inside the mass, major mass media, in particular the BBC. Many people felt that the coverage that was given to the anti-independence campaign, the no campaign, was completely disproportionate to that which was given to the yes campaign. We must remember that tens of thousands of people attended public meetings, took to the streets, held demonstrations. This great social movement, the history of it was almost entirely ignored by the major media outlets. In contrast, the threats and intimidation that came from the giant corporations, from the banks, from the International Monetary Fund, that if people voted yes, there would be economic meltdown, that jobs would be lost, that prices would rise, that pensions would be destroyed, and so on. All of this was given a great deal of publicity, and I think that imbalance uh, has greatly angered people and made them not trust the major politicians and also the BBC. It's a very interesting question. The, the British establishment, and I think you're right to say politicians, the BBC, which played a dreadful role uh, in uh, the Scottish referendum, was very biased. But also the mainstream media, academics and so on, were convinced that the Scots were going to vote no. Uh, and were saying it was going to be 60-40 from the very beginning. And indeed, at the beginning of the referendum campaign, it seemed as if the yes vote would only be 25%, 30% of, uh, of the vote. And really, they couldn't believe that the Scots might choose to quit the uh, United Kingdom. 
in particular, the Scots were rejecting this kind of neoliberal template, which is dominates the English-speaking world of economic and social measures. This is such a shibboleth, really, for the British establishment. The idea that people might reject or question this in any way was inconceivable. But at the end, in the final weeks, when uh, the opinion polls showed that a yes vote might be possible, there was real panic in the British establishment. Because uh, if there was a yes vote, it would mean a major diminution in British power around the world. I mean, to lose Scotland would be a serious blow. So what do the Scottish people consider to be the future for Scotland? Is the answer in their words. I don't know, to be honest. I really don't. I think we should have another referendum as soon as, but I'm not sure how long that's going to take. The future for Scotland um, is an English person and very patriotic. I hope they, they stay in the United Kingdom. Um, I think it's a great place to live. I love coming to Scotland to visit. Um, so I hope that they stay and I hope that the devolved powers that um, they're being given at the minute in terms of potential tax breaks and stuff. I hope that encourages them to stay. I would like to say that um, Scotland would remain part of the UK um, because everything, everything's better when it's united. Uh, terrifying. It'd be good to see the, the future for Scotland. It'd be great if the trajectory of the referendum kept up so that people were still politically engaged. However, we just have to hope that people keep going out, keep getting interested and see how it goes from there. Well, I think the future for Scotland is to have its own government uh, separation from Westminster. Uh, I think it's inevitable. It's going to be interesting. The future is going to be really interesting because I think Nicola Salmon, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, has now decided that she's a new person. So therefore, there's a chance for another vote, and who knows what's going to happen. As it stands, we will be governed by people who are alien to our culture alien to what Scotland needs, alien to what Scottish people want. <laughs> uh, there should probably be, there will probably be another referendum in like 2017 or 2020 and it'll be a yes because the no's can't pull the same tricks twice. If they get the devolution that, that's been promised, it should be very, very rosy indeed. With the revenue that Scotland has, the income that Scotland has, plus if they do do their own tax raising powers, Plus, we still have the Barnet formula coming into the country. It's got to be good. It's got to be good. And still being part of the United Kingdom. We asked our experts for their view on the same question, namely Scotland's future. It's very interesting that the mood that we saw during the referendum has continued subsequently. Uh, it's an extraordinary fact that the Scottish National Party has quadrupled its membership since the referendum. It's now the third largest party in Britain. And recently, there were two great meetings simultaneously. The Scottish National Party held a meeting of 12,000 people in Glasgow with its new leader, Nicola Sturgeon. And at the same time, the Radical Independence Campaign had a meeting of 3,000 to talk about the social issues that fueled the referendum debate. And that mood is continuing, and it won't go away. And we're going to see, I can say with some certainty, deep crisis for the Labour Party in Britain which uh, united with the Conservatives to defend the union of Britain, uh, but lost tens of thousands of its own supporters in the course of it. The future for Scotland is going to be a continuing political debate. There's added uh, spice to that by the fact that just in the last few days we have seen uh, an autumn budget put through by the Westminster government, which uh, were uh, respected for, uh, fiscal bodies are saying we're going to see a shrinking of the state expenditure in Britain to 1930s levels, which is quite frightening for people in terms of welfare. And I think that means that uh, it's going to add to people's idea that really, well, we were told some lies in the referendum campaign. We weren't told that our welfare standards were going to be cut back to the 1930s. So I think there's going to be a continuing political debate. I think there's going to be anger over that. I suspect there's going to be continued mobilisation. And people feel that uh, another referendum is possible. I mean, already a date of 2020 is one being played around with. There's another issue here, which is if the Conservatives won the British general election next May, then they're committed to hold a referendum in Britain's European Union membership. If that referendum went ahead, it's quite possible the people of England would vote to quit the European Union. The Scots would vote to stay in it and that would open up a big crisis. Clearly, all this has implications for Westminster's future. What are these? We asked the Scottish public to comment. We now have possibly a very divided nation, and the nation has become more aware of it. 
because I think s since the, the referendum in Scotland, we have, I don't think you would call it an uprising, but an awareness raising in England of the power that some people in England want to have. And so I think the issue has become a bigger issue than it was before. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. I hope Westminster has learned something from the whole process and realised that the public aren't going to just sit back and take whatever's thrown at them and that we want better and we deserve better. The future for Westminster is also very uncertain, I would imagine. I think the referendum is certainly shaking things up a little. It would be interesting to see if other countries, Northern Ireland, Wales, how they respond to it. And there's big changes required, so I'll have to see if they come. I think they're in... Um decline. I think there's going to be a lot more regional government in England as well. I think it's inevitable because people are fed up with Westminster politicians. The <laughs> uh, future for Westminster is they're just going to be a lot less powerful and a lot smaller. Well, I would like to think that we could get rid of the House of Lords for one thing and have a more equal society where we're electing people who want to represent people rather than lining their pockets. Oh, you know, can I be controversial and say that UKIP will make a lot of gains and maybe shake it up a bit? Well, that's a, good, that's a very good question. At the moment, I think it's a lot of people don't really trust um, politics in at Westminster. So I think it just needs a big shake up, uh, potentially with UKIP. Just, I don't know, another party potentially. Um, but yeah, I think it just needs a big shake up. There's two things. If Scotland got independence, uh, and there would be totally nothing to do with the UK, Westminster then would lose, I think, something like 54 Labour MPs. That would make them really hard to do anything against the Conservative uh, Party in Westminster. UKIP would then make huge inroads, and it would be maybe tragic for uh, Westminster. They wouldn't have the same balance of argument if that ever happened. That's what I think. Right now, it should be quite good. If they went to a federal state, which I feel they should do, it might be great. It might be great. Is it possible to know the future for Westminster? Here's what our experts said on the matter. Again, in Westminster, I think we are seeing a political crisis, first of all, on the right, because there's a deep split between the Conservative Party and the United Kingdom Independence Party, which is a racist populist party which is uh, endangering the belief that there will just be one party on the right. At the same time, uh, there are many people who very much hate what the Conservatives are doing, but are disillusioned with the Labour Party because the Labour Party is going to carry through the same sort of policies as the Conservatives. And the Scottish element is that Labour has always relied on winning a large number of MPs in Scotland in order to have a majority at Westminster. It can no longer rely upon that. At the same time, there's also going to be debate and discussion about what new powers the Scottish Parliament will have. And this will raise a whole number of issues about democracy and equality, which make politics at that level interesting for the first time for a long time for many people. I think Westminster is going to go through a series of scandals, and, and I think it may seem strange for the viewers to, 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 uh, to talk about this, but I think the, the allegations of child sex, a child sex ring involving, in the past, government ministers is a very serious thing. I mean, one right-wing newspaper has named two key members of Margaret Thatcher's cab cabinet in the 19, uh, 1980s involved in this. I mean, if this is true, it's going to be a major issue in British politics. It's going to knock confidence in Westminster, which has already been badly, uh, badly not. So I think there's a question, and clearly there's a very deep alienation from the established Westminster parties. Now, in England, that's mainly been reflected, as I said, in the rise of UKIP. In Scotland, clearly in uh, the rise in support for the independence of the referendum, and subsequent that, this huge surge of support for the Scottish National Party, now the third biggest party in the UK. But also in England, we've seen the Greens picking up support. We've seen uh, other elements. So there is a deep alienation from uh, the established parties. And that's something we've seen right across Europe. But it's here in this, uh, this country. Putting all this together, we turn to a simple but profound question. Is the United Kingdom still united? We invited the Scottish public to share their view. 
not united. I don't think it's been united for a while. I think that's a large part of the problem. You could ask whether it ever was united, really, N not just in the level of um, whether Scotland felt part of the UK or, or Northern Ireland felt part of the UK, but whether various different social groups feel part of, of, of the, uh, the UK. There are many people who felt for years and years that they're not really proper rep properly represented. I think the United Kingdom is still united. I think there's more people that want to be part of it and work together than there is that don't want to be. Has it ever been? <laughs> Has the United K Kingdom ever really been united? I think we're all individuals. I hope the United Kingdom is still united. Uh, it is certainly where I come from and I hope that it stays that way forever. The United Kingdom is no, not united at all. I don't think so. I think it's disunited. Uh, I think that we'll get another referendum by 2017, maybe 18, and I think there'll definitely be a yes vote. From a, a southerner's point of view, the United Kingdom is still very much united. I think it's united, yeah. I, um, you can see uh, people are a lot more interested in politics now. So um, there's a lot more people being interested in what's going on and so people are more aware and yeah, I think it's better, stronger together. It's fractured. It's fractured. It's still united, but uh, there's a couple of sticking plasters keeping it together at this moment in time. <laughs> uh, the United Kingdom's never been united. Um, there's always been the same class conflict between the working class and the people who effectively own them. So. No kind of national unity can cover up those kind, of tra uh, those kind of cracks. So is it true to say that the UK is still united in any objective sense? We gave the last word to our expert commentators. Uh, the United Kingdom has never been uh, united in my view. Uh, it's divided not so much depending on whether you're English or Scottish or Welsh, but much more on the lines of rich and poor. Uh, and that remains true. Uh, the poor of Glasgow in Scotland have much more in common with the poor of London or Manchester or Newcastle than they do with the rich of Scotland. Uh, and if you look at Britain, it's becoming a more and more unequal society. A tiny elite at the top have amassed vast wealth and people at the bottom have faced years of pay cuts, job losses, low wages, uh, benefits being taken away, attacks on disabled people and so on. Uh, and we're a very disunited kingdom, and that's why there is such a strong sense of frustration that exists in Britain, as it does in many other parts of Europe and the world. Uh, and if they continue with the same policies, the government, of cuts and attacks on working people, and they are going to continue with it, it's a recipe for social explosion. Uh, I don't know when it will happen, but it's certainly going to come in Britain. No, I don't think the United Kingdom is still united. And I think that's particularly true in terms of Scotland for uh, very much for uh, some of the working class people. And the feeling I had in Glasgow during the final days of the referendum was really those people had left the United Kingdom already. They'd given up in the United Kingdom because it had failed them. It had failed them in terms of their own experience of nearly four decades under Margaret Thatcher, under Tony Blair. The best their young sons had often got was being uh, sent into the British Army. They couldn't find jobs. The experience of Afghanistan they left a bitter taste among many of those people. They, they were giving up in the British state, and they're not going to go back. The Scottish ambition for independence has been a shake-up for the United Kingdom's confidence and image. The desire to break away from the rest of the Union has also been a major blow to the stature and security of Westminster and the Kingdom as a whole. And it was all caused by the disputes and tensions between Scotland and England. As a result, these once united islands will never be quite the same again. <laughs>